The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. We'll start reviewing with verse 5. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the second adjustment to God, and he is absolutely essential to a normal Christian life and functioning under God in the intake of Bible doctrine and the production of divine good and the glorification of God. This is your opportunity to check yourself and your mental attitude and keep it there during the time we're together. Let us pray. Father, we know from your word there, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We have chosen the way of life through Jesus Christ and the abundant life through the assimilation of the mind of Christ, Bible doctrine. Thank you for this opportunity. We do not take the opportunity for granted. Bless our time together in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Last night, we introduced the seven qualities for phase two success. Verse five. Now for this very reason also applying all diligence in your faith supply moral excellence and in your moral excellence knowledge verse 6 and in your knowledge self-control and in your self-control perseverance Excuse me. And in your perseverance, godliness. All right, we we're working on the analysis of, the, of this. Now, this all this is a developing argument. I can't touch base on all of it. Uh, I introduced the uh, fifth verse by saying this refers back to the preceding uh, t uh, discussion in verse five. Uh, uh, I mean in verse 4, excuse me, uh, that God has granted to us uh, his magnificent promises and that you are all, that you are partakers of the divine nature. I explained that if you're a believer, you have partaken of the divine nature. You have within you eternal life, the Holy Spirit, and you are imputed with God's perfect righteousness. So to that degree, that said, that's, the, that's the setup for uh, the phase three factor. But in the meantime, we have a responsibility to uh, live up to our calling, as it were, and this is the seven, uh, seven virtues that are listed here, or qualities, for phase two success. Uh, and so to point six, and an analysis on page 15, self-control, is the third virtue. We discussed the other one, one uh, the first and second. Self-control is the third virtue. You've got to have self-control over your life, your emotions, your STA, and you cannot let those things run out of control. Self-control. The noun occurs four times. This is the very self-control uh, that we're gonna study uh, to the opposite extreme that they were dealing with uh, in the second letter, uh, the antinomians, who gave free reign to their lust patterns and their STAs. It'll get you in a ton of trouble. And you cannot, you cannot uh, afford to uh, cast this to the wind. You have to have, in circumstances, you have to use your volition and your doctrine 
and get control over things because everything is surely not going to go your way. You have to understand that. And self-control also relates to just running amok under your STA because it's something you want. Okay. Because of knowledge, we have the power to keep our sin natures in check, our emotions. Next, fourth, comes perseverance. Hupomone. It's a compound, which means to stay under something. Abide under. The noun means literally remaining under. Eight, it is used of patience with respect to circumstances in our life. It's very critical. You have got to be patient. Wait on God and uh, quit taking matters into your own hands. We need endurance to complete our course. This is, a, this is, this is not a sprint. This is a long distance race, a marathon, if you will. And so in Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, we read, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses, those are the ones that went before us. See, this comes after chapter 11, where you're talking about examples of, of believers that stood tall in various, very a variety of circumstances. Therefore, since we have a great cloud of witnesses, they'll bear witness that doctrine works. They're in heaven, but they're a cloud of witnesses. The doctrine works, and everything God says is true. They're up there. We have this cloud of witnesses surrounding us. So what are we supposed to do? Let us lay aside. We're using an athletic metaphor here. Training in, 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 in uh, Olympic type games of the time, athletes train by having weights on their ankles. And but when it came time to compete, they removed those weights. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. Easily entangles us and wraps us up in things. Sin nature's there, ready to pounce. Carried step after step, takes you further, further down the road. Uh, you can have a bad day, you can have a bad experience, uh, all the rest of it, but like the athlete, you're in a race, lay aside. That's rebound. I was talking to a believer today, Dawn Doctrine, it's not here locally, but in another place in the state. He said, I have, a, I have a, a, a person I've worked with in construction. He's Church of Christ and he says he never sins. never sins he sure faked out he says a nice guy hard working he's generous he says he, he because in their in their deal you lose your salvation can you even imagine being in a place where you didn't know whether one minute or the next you were saved and if you do commit a sin you lose it and then what you got they're big on baptism. You gotta believe, because baptism is, faith in Christ isn't enough, you gotta be baptized too, it's a work. What a mess. Then you gotta go get baptized again? I get baptized every day, I sin every day. Well, what's this? Because you're unsaved, right? Therefore, you gotta redo it? See, this, this is the uh, ball of tangled twine that they're in. And you can't talk to him. He never sins. Of course he does. Right now he's sinning by opening his mouth and saying that. And, and, and I was on the phone with him. This is Barney. I was on the phone. Hi, Barney. I was on the phone with him. And I said, what do they do with these scriptures? They just ignore them. 
I said, there's a verse in Proverbs. Says, there's not a righteous man that continually does good and does not sin. If we say we do not sin, we lie and the truth isn't in us. We all stumble in many ways. Read what Paul said about himself and his STA in Romans 8. <sighs> so that's a whole big denomination. They can read what you and I read. Let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us and uh, 1036 he says to these believers who were spiritually flagging due to chronic prolonged persecution by fellow Jews in the land before the fifth cycle And he's trying. You, and this letter was designed to snap them out of it and get them back in the same way they were when, well, uh, before they went astray. I'm going to read with 32. He's telling these believers. Now, obviously, that there's a lot of believers in different churches within this nation of Israel at the time. And this was like something that was had infected a lot of them he said but remember the former days <clears throat> when after being enlightened here's the order of events new believers get enlightened they get on track this comes first there's this lull after you became enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings. Partly by being made a public spectacle. All the things you could imagine that they did to make people public spectacles. And calling them out in public and doing all kinds of things to try to dissuade them. By being made a public spectacle. Through reproaches, that's verbal. Verbal, verbal attacks through reproaches. <clears throat> and tribulations, that's general for any kind of pressures they put on you. And partly by becoming shares with those who were so treated, you're in good company. But you showed sympathy to the prisoners. Some of them went to jail for their faith. They were incarcerated. And what did the good believers do? They visited them. They put themselves right out there on the line. Typically in history, prisoners get to have visitors. Uh, and accepted joyfully. How can you do that? The seizure of your property, your, your property, your possessions. They, they just came in and took them plundered them and you did it joyfully because you had the doctrine of SG3 in your mind and you knew God is in control and he can and will replace any of it that is lost can you imagine having your possessions taken illegally by religious fanatics or whoever here's how they could do it joyfully in fellowship, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. SG3. You got something better. You know you have just racked up a bunch of SG3. God isn't going to forget it. They have, these believers have been in heaven a long time, and they haven't got their SG3 yet, but they're going to get it. For way back in the day when they suffered imprisonment, taking their property and all the rest of it. A better possession. That's, that's, a, that's a phrase found in Hebrews. 
I like it. Better possession. And it's better to the nth degree. Better. Because it's forever. Nothing can destroy it. You can't die and be separated from it. It is something that is so phenomenal that it is described in terms of eye is not seen, ear is not heard. It hasn't entered into the imagination of man. And some people have really good imaginations. The things that God has prepared for those who love him and stick with it to the end. And the crown is, the, the, the top one is the crown. <laughs> Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. And I've, I've seen a lot of that, throwing away their confidence. The ones had all this confidence and then they threw it away and went away. Does it make any sense? No, it's insanity. They threw away their confidence. Good, at one time, good and strong believers. You probably know some of them. They threw it away. It's not just that they're not going to get the they're not going to they're not going to stand tall at the bema seat. They'll get the rewards that they. This is in the book in the, in this book too. That even though you're failing, you're still going to get the rewards you've earned. You, 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 those are you, you, those aren't thrown away because now you are uh, you, you're in this situation. Uh, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And then he quotes a scripture from the Old Testament here in verse 30, in verse 37. He makes a, we have, we have a quotation from Malachi, I believe it is. Uh, anyway, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. That's why you're here tonight. You live by faith. This works. This is what I'm sticking with. The pastor's talking about things I have not seen and reality is out there, but I, but I, but I have confidence and I have faith and, and so I'm enduring. Whatever, I, whatever CHP's common human problems, whatever testing, big, small, and all the rest of it, I'm gonna endure it. And don't let the outside world and people and things distract you. Dangle it in front of you. And you make that more important than being consistent in Bible class under face-to-face -face teaching. Let these other people all run out there and pursue vanity and chasing after the wind. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's God's attitude towards the believer that peels off from sound doctrine. My soul has no pleasure in him. Now, any one of these people can recover. We've seen that from their stupidity and their error. They can do that, fine. But he's talking about a permanence that, that while they're in that mode, I don't, want to, I don't want to get up in the morning. I don't want to get up any day and I realize God is fully on my side because I'm walking in the truth. I'm executing my responsibility before him in time. One more day. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but those who have faith to the preservation of the soul. Okay. The fifth item is godliness, eusebia, and is used of behavior directed devotedly towards God. You got to keep his word and his thoughts before you all day long, ideally, in every situation, good and bad, something nice happens, something positive happens. It doesn't take but a second to say, thank you. 
It could be something real minor. Thank you for that. Showing your capacity and you know the source, the ultimate source of your blessing uh, as a believer. The noun occurs 15 times and we won't look these all up. The noun incorpor incorporates attitude, conduct, and worship. God in us enables them to be true to God and resist the lawlessness of the false teachers. Moving on to other virtues. And in your godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness, uh, you remember this word has the definite article. It's Philadelphia. <laughs> Philadelphia. The Greek Philadelphia. Brotherly love. Six times in the New Testament. And in your brotherly kindness, in your Philadelphia, love, agape. There's no greater of all the virtues than agape love for God and for fellow believers. Agape, it's supernatural. The sixth item is brotherly kindness. It occurs six times. Romans 12, 10, 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, Hebrews 13, 1, 1 Peter 1, 22, and our verse. The godly must cling together like so many brothers in a family that is under assault and testing and adversity. We are, to, we are to, to unite. We're not to be islands to ourselves. We are to interact appropriately with each other. It was nothing more than sponsored by, good to see you, how are you? When I say that, I mean it. Whoever you are, whatever, I'm all for you as a pastor, teacher, as a fellow believer. The godly must cling together like so many brothers in a family that is under assault. We come together. We're on the same page. We're not out here indifferent. We, we can't know everything everybody's going through, but we're a pretty small group. And you get, if you interact with people at all, in this church, on the property, off the property, texting. I think it's a nice device. I can, I can text someone and say, good morning. Hope you're having a good day. You're in my prayers. You put up those little symbols. You know, <laughs> little heart, you know, symbols. Just checking in, everything okay? If someone misses, I don't do it with everybody, but, but if someone's under some particular testing I'm aware of, I wanna give, give them some encouragement with just a, just a few words. The pastor teacher's thinking about them, cares about them. Got any special prayer requests? Tell me, I'll put it on my list. It is important that we exude the friendliness of those who share a common bond. <clears throat> that we do that. Not be withdrawn. And, well, some people are shy, and I understand that. But they still, you know, I have those that are shy. I, 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 could, I could strike up a conversation with them if I need to. They'll talk to me. And I don't expect everybody to do this. Don't get me wrong. Don't misread any of it. But they'll come in. They'll go, I know it's like a salute. Glad to be here. Glad to have made it. Or a smile or something. I interact with people like that. How you doing? You know. And I know because the group is so small, I pretty well know a lot of the big tests that are going on. If you wrote down your biggest test right now on your piece of paper, right now, at this moment in time, uh, I may know about it, and I'm already praying about it. 
you got to know that. I'm observant. I'm supposed to. To have a health test, I'm, I go through the health list group. From big to minor. And I know you're praying for me. Because we need each other. I don't see any other options. I need to be healthy enough to be able to be up here. Mentally, physically, whatever my limitations are physically, they are not, I can tell you, they are not impacting my ability to teach you and lead you spiritually. The sixth item is love, agape. Is even broader than fraternal friendliness. You know how close people can be in families, brothers and sisters and all that? That's fine. But this is what we are. We're in a family. We're in a family. And agape can express itself in many different ways. I can't, I can't trade tests with you, but I can bear your burden in prayer. I can say words of encouragement, face to face, on the phone, texting, or on a phone call, or by helping you, if I can, physically. Or get somebody in this church to help you. It's called agape love. God is love, one of his attributes. So love includes the love of God, one another, and even enemies. That might be a hard one to swallow, but you can do it. You want the best for them. And so you will treat them as much as possible properly. The importance of the cultivation of these qualities is seen in the three verses that follow. Verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, if these qualities are yours and on the increase, for if these uh, are yours, uh, if these qualities are yours, uh, we have a present participle, hoop arco, which means to be at one's disposal. It's just translated here, are. If these qualities are at your disposal and are increasing, pleonazo, the verb to increase, they render you neither useless or, nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. They render you uh, render is the present active indicative. Kathistami can be used a number of ways. It can mean to appoint someone, appoint something, put in charge, point. Here translate render. Neither, negative. The word useless is argos, an adjective, which can mean, it, it can be a term to be idle, unemployed, or useless, nor unfruitful. Ude used to reinforce a negative, unfruitful. A karpos, karpos is fruitful. Put the alpha negative on the front of it, makes it unfruitful. Unfruitful in the true knowledge, the epinosis knowledge of Jesus Christ. One. For if these qualities refers to virtues which we are to which are to complement our faith like i said before you believe the truth you believe the bible then you have these virtues that you cultivate as you grow in grace and knowledge the words are yours consists of a verb huparco be present be at one's disposal and a pronoun you the participle are increasing poianizo to increase, indicates continued spiritual growth and development as evidenced by improvement in the virtues. 
You can make improvements. Even small ones are, are, are to make, to think about these things. We could pick one out of the list and say, you know, I, I, I would go off on the least little thing, but I, I've been de developing self-control. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose uh, you're just doing something and nobody's fault except yours, and you drop or spill or break something. I'm just using an illustration because I've done it. And you get all upset, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and, a, and a few expletives come out of your mouth. That is not self-control. Do you expect to go through life and never stumble, never break anything, never spill anything? That's unreasonable. It's how you handle your mental attitude. So there you can improve in this. Self-control. The words are, oh, okay, I gave you that. Uh, the participle are increasing indicates continued spiritual growth and development. Christian character is evidenced by improvement in, all, in the virtues. The virtues do not come about in a day, and all diligence will produce a steady increase and growth in these virtues. You will change on the inside out. You used to be such a, you're different now. Yeah, least little thing would set you off. But it's not that way anymore. You take things in stride. The verb occurs with two negative adjectives. They render, so the negative adjectives, useless. As I said, argos, means can be someone who is unemployed. And people can be unemployed and there's nothing wrong with it, but there are those that are employed because they're lazy, useless, and unfruitful. Unfruitful, Declare a negative and a mild way, and in a mild way, what is intended to be positive and strong. The cultivation of the virtues of a dynamic faith result in much divine good production. Anything you do as you do it is under the Lord. Suffer, do your regular daily routine, go to work, school. And you do these things and you're occupied with God and in fellowship, uh, you're, you're fruitful. Big tasks, little tasks, all of it. Because it's all going to come back to us at the Bama seat. And don't say, oh, I got enough SG3. Well, what's that mean? You won't be saying that in the afterlife. Because those that don't have it or have very little, if any, they're going to look at us. And they're going to know they blew it but they're not gonna be miserable about it. It's just a fact of life. You exploited the plan of God. A lot of these Christians, well, they don't have the doctrine. They don't even know, they don't study this. Not really. Forget it. I've talked to a number of people about what's going on in some of these churches out here that I was told were all so great. They are not. I know of something about certain things that are good and top rate and things that are not. And I know about the spiritual thing too because they're not teaching these doctrines. I have some people that have been in these churches that have come back and they'll tell you that. They'll tell you things I go, really? That's what they do? Yeah. That's what they think church is supposed to be about. A bunch of singing, extracurricular activity, food, uh, who knows? Guest speakers floating all around, bouncing around from one thing to the next. Yes, yeah, like the Bible says, they have ears that need to be tickled. And I, I, I said, they wouldn't last. They'd hardly last a Bible class in here, and I wouldn't last in one of their churches probably beyond a, a message or two. Because you know why? you're gonna step all over their human viewpoint. You're gonna check and, you're, and, and, and they know that they're doing these things and they don't like the light shine, shining on them. 
where we're positive and it may be painful, but we'll let the light shine on us. Because the word of God is a critic. It's a critic. We didn't labor all these verses, just you know, go off and emulate the cosmos. No, they don't want to go to a place where their, 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 their human viewpoint and ST activity is exposed and brought into the light. Where you and I, we'll get right under the light. And if we have some sin, we don't even know it's a sin and we're doing it all the time because there's a psalm where the psalmist prays, if there's anything in me that's a, that's a miss that I'm, that I'm oblivious to, make it clear to me. That's what it's about. So the cultivation of these virtues of a dynamic faith result in much divine good production. Epinosis is again brought forward to show the basis for the divine good production. So we're not off in human good. Human good is doing the right thing out of fellowship. It's also getting caught up in, I don't know, so many things. You know, this church has a, has a special place out here to help people who are recovering drug addicts. We don't do that. We'll help you recover spiritually, and if you need medical attention, then you can go to those places and get your medical attention. If you can't just get away from it on your own, if you need that crutch, fine. But they will, they will throw a bunch of human viewpoint at you. So that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's good and there's good. These people are caught up in human good. The UN's all about human good. Look how corrupt it is. Oh, before I let you go, you know what Putin said about the debate? It's all show. <laughs> it's a big joke. And I mean both sides. It's a joke. And I don't care who becomes president because I know something. I know that it's the one God wants in there. You say, well, God wouldn't want a corrupt a communist in there. You don't think so, huh? We get what we deserve. <laughs> and he'll advance his plan with the most corrupt people and has done it. Oh, everyone would like a more conservative person who doesn't have enough doctrine to come out of the rain. What, 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 what did Trump say? If she gets in there, Israel will be destroyed in two years. I don't think so. Do you have a pastor teacher? Apparently not. But the fundies all get excited if, the, if God's name is used and something says positive about Jesus Christ. They think that's just great. That'll hardly get you there. They don't know what we know. We see where it's coming. The one big question I have, I just pray about it, with regard to the development of the prophetic thing, is when are they going to put up that temple? I think about that off, off and on. When are they going to put up the temple? This isn't something you can just throw up overnight. Even with big equipment and everything they got and, and, and God's blessing them right and left, are they going to build it before the trib or in the trib or a combination? And what has to change on the ground in Israel to make this possible? They start building a temple tomorrow, the way I see it, all hell will break loose. So just keep praying about it. I've thought of scenarios, but I have to live one day at a time like everyone else. I've thought of scenarios. I know how you can bring down some moss and you don't have to blow them up. You let God do it. Some big earthquakes. You say, well, that's not the right location. Okay, okay, okay. 
Maybe they'll put it in the wrong location, but it's still the temple and it serves its purpose. They got all the peripheral stuff ready to go. They've got, that. all they need is the green light. But it isn't something you can do, just, those temples are 20, 30 ton foundation stones and all that, and it has to all go up, and then all that has to be in the interior and everything. Yeah, if you get the right people and start working on it and it's coordinated properly, a lot can get done quick with divine blessing and help. But there has to be a trip, there has to be a temple, whether it has to be for the whole three and a half years, well, it's gonna be there for the, uh, it's gonna be there. This guy in the book, he says something, he never, he never gives any documentation with regard to his statement that the Antichrist is gonna build it. Why would the Antichrist build the Holy Temple? So I, I, I didn't completely dismiss that. Because the Antichrist is not going to get on this earth and scream, kill all the Jews, contrary to what you might think. You know what Satan wants to do with him? He wants to preempt and put his guy as the ruler of Jerusalem. His, his fake Messiah. He, didn't want, he doesn't want to make him the, the Messiah over some other city. He wants to make it over Jerusalem. That, that's the prize. I mean, he's going to come up against and trounce good big time Israel's enemies. Those nations that are in close and all the rest of it. He's, he's going to do that. He's going to, his battle is a, let's just take over all the Jews and kill them all off. It isn't going to be that way. The Jews he wants to kill are the ones that are Christians. That's why they go into these places of hiding and he sends an army out to get them. He makes a treaty with the Jews, the leadership, a seven-year treaty in the middle of the tribulation. How ironic that I'll protect you from all your enemies for seven years and then we can renew the treaty. In the meantime, you call me your Messiah. And the Jews will sign off on it. The leaders. Israel will be highly polarized between those who turn to Christ and those who stay in unbelief. So I know, uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all this, trying to sort it out, because that's what I like to do. I like to meditate and think about these things. This is how I'm at some of my breakthroughs in history. Something was gnawing on me. Something didn't make sense and the scripture's right in front of me. That's how I came to the conclusion of who the Antichrist is. I wasn't even in the book of Revelation. I wasn't even in, I was somewhere else, I don't remember. And I just sat down and I looked at the verses and let them tell me what they were telling me. And all my other ideas about who, who the Antichrist could be and all the rest of it, threw them out. And, I, and it's been proven right. It's Alexander the Great, hands down. I told you the other night, didn't I? They found Cleopatra's tomb. Were you here? They found her. Not that this affects Bible prophecy, but it's, just, it's a curiosity. They found her sarcophagus. That was kind of interesting. I always liked ancient history anyway, especially ancient history. Now I know why. Jesus Christ is the source of our epinosis. The Holy Spirit is the one who reveals the particulars. That's his, that's his function in the Godhead. Anything I, I know about the plan of God in truth, I got it from the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, I had to study, I had to work at it, but he, he, he enlightened me. Sometimes the information on a particular topic came from an outside source. I don't care, you just gotta check out the details. That's what happened with a number, a number of these doctrines. Theme got me on the true doctrine of the blood of Christ. I got that one. And I've, and I've done some improvements and, and add-ons to it to, to, to clarify it further. It vibrated me at first. It's like someone said to me, Jack, when I first heard the flat earth, he said, yeah, it was about all I could do. He said, it took me six, six times to go through this till I, till I finally could start shedding this stuff. I said, fine. 
at least you gave it a hearing and didn't just blow it off and say something stupid. You checked it out. And you saw this makes perfect sense. But when we're ingrained with something, when it's like a religion to us, science, so-called, the Bible says, knowledge falsely so-called, raised up against the knowledge of God. It's all going to be brought down and exposed. I don't think the Antichrist will be a, 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 a believe this cosmology one bit. I think he's going to be all flat earth. I got reasons for it, too. He knows Jesus Christ is right up there. He doesn't deny his existence like an atheist. No, no. He's going to wage war against him, the lamb, the beast. He's been in hell a long time. He's got a lot of time to think. And then he's going to be put back on earth and downloaded with so much good information about technical things and history and all the rest that he's been out of, out of pocket with for centuries. He'll be able to tell secrets that are true about some things that the historians got wrong. And they'll be very impressed with it. But then, then he's promoting the big lie that he's God and should be worshiped, or else. Okay. Believers should be increasing in divine good and epinosis, Colossians 1.10. See you Sunday, God willing. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity.